Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on where you are joining us from. A very warm welcome to uh, one and all to the API Days Live Singapore 2021, <clears throat> the day one session. Uh, now we are going to have the first track in the technical stage that the series of talks will fo focus on the topic connecting the stack. A warm welcome again. Joining us on the first session will be Tim Nicholas, SRE Principal Engineer at Xero, and Julie Gunderson, Advocate DevOps at PagerDuty. They will be focus, discussing on embracing incidents as a necessity. Tim, Julie, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure Thanks to be for here. Having us. Yep. <laughs> well, hi, okay. everybody. Um, I, uh, I'm Julie Gunderson. I'm a DevOps advocate here at PagerDuty. Um, and really excited to talk to you today about incidents and how we want to embrace them. And uh, Tim, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Tim Nicholas. I'm a principal engineer in the SRE team at Xero. I'm based down in Wellington, New Zealand. And I, I really like to spend a lot of my time focusing on uh, making sure that we can learn from things going right, going wrong in production and, uh, and really build the expertise in how we operate systems. And so a big part of that is incidents uh, and uh, getting as much value from them as we can. Um, and so today, I guess, really sort of the frame for this conversation is to think about how incidents are not just an unpleasant thing that we're, uh, you know, we, we get to because things have gone catastrophically wrong, um, but also a thing that's really necessary and helpful and, and a key part of developing services in a modern world with complex systems uh, and, and big teams and all of those sort of uh, great things we have to deal with all day, every day that keep our, our lives and our, and our professional work really interesting. And Tim and I don't have any slides to share with you. I have a talk after this um, on incident command and we'll share plenty of slides during that talk. Right now, we just wanted to talk to folks about incidents and incident response and what it means to be a learning organization. And so <clears throat> Tim and I have spoken together before and, and we, we've talked about embracing incidents as a necessity. And, and at PagerDuty, we like to say that incidents are a gift because they're a way for our systems to talk to us, but they're more of an opportunity to learn and to refine not just our systems and our tooling, but also our processes. And, and Tim and I talk about this a lot, but Tim, do you wanna kick us off with why we like to embrace incidents? Yeah, I guess, I guess the really key thing is that they're, as you say, they're an opportunity to learn um, and they're an opportunity uh, to to do practice, like to to deal with things that are surprising that you couldn't have anticipated in advance, or more relevantly that you didn't anticipate in advance, um, and to to really examine reality about operating your systems, whatever they may be, and and so there's a bunch of stuff that comes with that, uh, like building the relationships and the expectations of each other and understanding other systems um, and sort of finding out where the gaps in personal knowledge might be, um, but also uh, sort of building that more complex view of your organization, of, of the things that you depend on, uh, how those things might operate in the margins when perhaps there's, there's more traffic than you anticipated or something like that, right? So it's not necessarily that someone's deployed a thing that was bad. Um, Lots of incidents are are not because of change that we've introduced deliberately, but because you know perhaps your your platform is growing, you've got more customers, you've got more traffic, um, and so they're a sign of success as well, right? The fact that you you have uh, your know, customers using your platform and that someone cares about whether you've got a problem uh, is a good thing, right? And so these things happen. How do we learn from them? How do we how do we adapt? And how do we set up systems inside our organizations to make sure that we are taking advantage of those opportunities? Um, and well, I guess, oh, sorry, go Julie, go on. Well, I was just going to say our systems are so complex now. This isn't about an if an incident happens. This is a when an incident happens because incidents will happen. And so uh, you mentioned practicing, right? And sometimes uh, Tim and I have chatted before about chaos engineering which is a great way to practice. Not every organization is ready for that. Um, but incidents 
you can still practice your learning through them. And you can also get your teams ready to handle incidents in an organized way. Um, because again, if, if you don't have any incidents at all or ever, um, are you working as an organization to, to have that competitive advantage? Are you looking at ways to make that customer experience better? Um, in some organizations, Tim, we talked about this, some organizations don't make a lot of changes, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's probably less true for a, an API <laughs> kind of audience, right? People will be making changes. They're yeah. developing. They're trying to, to have some velocity and trying to deliver value for their customers. Um, so it's important that they're doing that. The One of the challenges with having no incidents is that it's kind of how do you count these things, right? There's a there's a big sort of debate about things like MTTR, which we don't need to go into necessarily. But um, but one of the things that I like to I think is important to encourage is to actually have uh, have have incidents as a thing that are both acceptable and are embraced and encouraged and uh, and that people work with really well. So um, if you if you've got an environment where you don't think you've got any incidents, like no, no one declared any incidents in the last month, let's say, um, then I think that there's that's a signal in itself. But it's a signal that you don't have signal about. Like it's telling you that you don't really know if anything's going wrong or not. Um, and it's telling you that you don't have any, you're not getting any practice, right? So your, your um, incident response processes, even if you've done training in the past, they're going to be getting rusty and your systems are going to be changing. And maybe you're going to be less able to uh, to respond as a, as a group than you might be if you if you went through that process a little bit more often. And so it's possible to use those situations to say, well, are we are we correcting things in production that we're just not saying are incidents? And why is that? Are we scared of of saying we had an incident? Is there some negative consequence of that? Can we can we sort that out? Um, or maybe we're just not sensitive enough to the experiences of our of our customers or of, of our services um, and so maybe then you can go in and you know maybe you can go and do chaos engineering maybe that's the right thing to do for you and, and, and where the organization is um, but alternatively maybe you just during the day you sort of tune tune your alerts to be a little bit more sensitive and to give you some signal to say oh hey actually we've got more variability of our latency than we than we thought we did. How can we respond to that in a, in a way that's positive? And how can we be curious about our systems? Um, really getting in there and and learning from those situations. We're like, ah, oh, I didn't think that should happen. Oh, it did. Interesting. Even though it's self-corrected, but actually I've learned something from looking at that. Um, and I've learned perhaps which other teams might be involved uh, and have built some relationships. Um, well, and, and it's interesting. I, part of my role as a DevOps advocate is I uh, work with a lot of customers going through cultural transformation. And I, I recently had a conversation with a customer and they talked about certain teams that actually game their systems so that they don't actually get tracked as major incidents because that is uh, a metric that's measured in a not positive way in the organization. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a pretty scary situation because the longer we take to act on a major incident, the worse it becomes, especially with Twitter and <clears throat> Yelp and all of the ways that customers can voice their uh, unhappiness with a product that can really damage a reputation. So at PagerDuty, we, we talk about seconds matter, right? And that's what we're trying to do is, is get the right people on the phone and get the incident resolved. And, 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 when people are afraid of being judged or blamed in their organization because of incidents, then that's where we see a lot of a breakdown. And so um, I know you and I have talked a lot about just the cultural implications on how do we create these psychologically safe organizations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for me, one of the important things about that is is uh, is a, a seeing incidents as a positive thing, as an opportunity, uh, as a thing that we can get a lot of value out of. Um, but secondly, of not actually uh, counting incidents and using that as a as a number as if it means something, right? So you had two critical incidents in the last X amount of time. Well, that what does that mean? What it means is that someone decided that something was going to fall into that category at some point. Um, and so the fact that it's there's always a subjective element to the categorization of incidents. Um, 
means that it's really open to being gamed and it's not open to being gamed in a way that is like it from a from an engineer point of view you might be saying look i'm i'm going to do this under the radar i'm still going to fix it because i care about my customers but i'm going to do it under the radar so that i don't get yelled at by somebody or so that i don't get that sort of sniffy look about oh, if only you'd done that properly you should try harder next time right so so people then do it under the radar then they have a harder time taking the time to do the sort of investigation and learning that might be necessary and the whole organization misses out uh, from the value they could have got from that scenario. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we see a lot of um, engineers any, anywhere that I've really heard of who, who don't want to do to to provide a good service. Right? They're not like, ah, eh, it's down. Who cares? Right? That's that's not a reality that um, that exists in any real way. Um, but what we do see is is that if that environment isn't psychologically safe then they will try and find ways to work around that. And the bit that is lost out of that is, uh, is the learning and the, the sort of positive relationships that can come from that. And that learning might be about the, the specifics of technology, but equally it might be about workload on teams. It might be about uh, you know, the kind of, of uh, product direction they're getting, right? It could be at any level. Um, and that's, that's, again, can be challenging. Um, but is this just that's there when things go wrong and then you have an opportunity to step back and reflect on it. Um, and that, that's a really critical piece of, of learning is having the opportunity where something's gone wrong and then the ability to, to stand back and reflect. Yeah, we talk about that a lot in, in the term of blameless postmortem. So, okay, your incident has happened and now, now you're learning from it. But there's so much more than just the very specific technical details that you can learn, like you can talk about and learn about. Did your process work? How, how, how were your alerts? Did all of your alerts work? Was your monitoring right on? But, but the key thing is, is taking those learnings and then turning them into action items because you want to make that process better for the next person that has to deal with it. Think about your coworkers or think about future you in a month that might be sitting on a call and, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about postmortems and after action items is that to-do list and getting buy-in for that to-do list. And sometimes not everything on that to-do list, the ROI may not be worth it to stop something like this from happening in the future. But then how do you update your documentation so that if something happens, it's easily remedied, right? So that's a big part of the learning that you can take with you as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do de-emphasize the action items in how I talk about these things because I think that the the learning stuff is so much more critical and has to happen directly. Right? The, so the focus for me of incident learning processes is the direct learning. And then as a result of the learning, like we find out how we got where we are. We find out how things went wrong. We find out what the pressures were on, on people doing work. And then... Uh, once we've done that learning, people are able to make better engineering decisions, right? And and those better engineering decisions are things that go into backlogs to, to do differently. They're people thinking in advance when they're designing the next uh, thing and they think, uh, you know what? I, I know it's worth doing the the few hours work to get some retries in here because I've been burned before. And, and so like whatever it might be, um, getting that rich, rich sort of story told of what happened here and not just this thing this queue filled up and then and then it was bad but sort of how we got there that story is really critical um and so i try and emphasize that and in terms of like doing a, a sort of post-incident review a post-mortem uh I, I one of the things that's really important there is to not from my point of view is to not create a whole bunch of of tickets to do that are pointless, right? Well, that, that won't get done. And if they don't get done, they were pointless to begin with, right? So so there's the perspective that they were um, either uh, not well understood, like it might have been a good idea from someone's perspective, um, but but the people who need to do that work, need to prioritize it, don't care. They don't know enough to, about that thing to understand why it's valuable. Um, or they genuinely, think, well, actually, it's already been solved by that other thing. Like This is just you know, belt and braces, and we've got other more important things to do. And that might be totally legit. Um, and and that's more of a challenge when people haven't done the proper um, sort of 
examination of reality. They haven't observed what actually happened well enough. And so that's why for me in the post-incident learning phase, that's, that's what that's about. It's about describing reality so that we can make really good decisions in the future. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things that we talk about, too, is starting your timeline before the incident actually happened and working your way forward in that post-incident review versus working your way backwards from resolution. I do want to pause and say that if anybody has questions for us, Tim and I will also be uh, answering questions. So just feel free to pop them in that Q&A yeah, and we'll be able to, to answer any of those questions. Um some of the other things that Tim and I like to talk about are the skills necessary for incident response. So we've talked a lot about practice, but there there are some skills for incident response. And Tim, you want to kick us off a little bit on that path? Yeah, I guess in a way, I'm going to try and tie this in with with the fact that we're at API days, right? So one of the things that's really important about when we're, when we're designing APIs and we're sort of thinking about API first and how we design our systems we're thinking about how do I decouple my system from that other system that some other team is doing? How that lets us move fast, it lets us make really good decisions within a tight domain, uh, and that's great, right? And that's uh, actually helps us in some cases avoid some some sort of collaboration requirements that might exist otherwise, you know, in, integration nightmares or whatever it might be, right? So, so that's. That's a really good thing about using APIs, but one of the risks of that is that we uh, we don't have to work with other people day to day doing our work. And then when something goes wrong, um, something surprising happens, we're very likely to have to work with people that we we that aren't on our direct team, uh, and and so we need a different kind of connectivity and and these relationships that exist. Like we need to have really loosely coupled technical systems. But we need to have really good connections between the people in the system as well so that they actually can maintain a sort of common ground about what's happening. They can use common language. Um, and they know each other. Like, it's possible. We've built some really good relationships with people inside incident response under stress. But it's much better to be able to have those relationships already there that you can call on. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the really important things in incident response for me is maintaining common ground seeing when it's breaking down, seeing when perhaps someone's misinterpreted another message from somebody else and saying, hey, just to clarify, or um, perhaps you use Slack and, and you sort of uh, you know, close out a Slack thread with something that goes back to the main channel, summarizing what's happened in that, in that sidebar. Um, so that sort of ability to, to go, actually, we've got maybe 10, 15, maybe, maybe a lot more people responding to this incident, and they all need to have some level of common understanding of what's going on how do we do that and that's a that's a skill that people don't have just naturally particularly not when working remotely um, because it can be harder to see that someone has perhaps interpreted a word differently um, so that that sort of uh, maintenance of a shared mental model of of what's happening or of what each other are doing um, is a really really critical part of, of incident response Thank you. And I, I see some questions coming in and I know we have some time at the end, but I want to I want to get to some of these because I think they're great for the conversation that we're having. So one question is, what makes teams realize they require change within their organization um, with respect to incident response? Um, I can kind of kick that off a little bit. One of the things that uh, that we see is that there has been a major incident Some, the, when an organization maybe comes to us for the first time. There's been a major incident. There's been something that was headline worthy that uh, they didn't handle in the in the right way, meaning there was a lot of chaos. So I like to talk about the 100 square Zoom meeting where everybody in the organization is on the call three o'clock in the morning because we all know that that's when incidents seem to happen, right? But that becomes a very expensive call for an organization as a whole because now you've woken everybody up and people still have to work the next day. There, there's Or something happens in the middle of the day. Now you have 100 people that have just context switched, right? And the amount of time lost in that versus when you can have an incident call with eight people on it or, or, or four people who are just really working to resolve that. So generally, from what I've seen, it can be a really big thing that happens at an organization when they're like, this is just not working. But Tim, what do you think? Yeah, that's that's certainly true. I mean, a, a major incident is going to sharpen the mind. Uh, and <laughs> but, but I think just a major incident isn't enough. Um, the, the key piece that needs to go with that or that I, I see working 
um, uh, you know, heard stories from from lots of organizations. You need to have that major incident, but you also need to tell a good story about that incident and to be able to know enough about it. And that's kind of hard because if you don't have good incident investigation or, or um, review kind of processes, it might be really easy to get to a like, well, someone should have done their job better, case closed, right? Human human error as the as the cause of this thing, which which is a thing that just shuts down inquiry and and right. and stops learning, right? So so the the challenge is to be able to have that thing that goes wrong and to be able to tell a story about what that was, how it happened, uh, and uh, and and to, to highlight the fact that maybe actually we were more brittle than we expected. We had this limitation on, on our human capacity to respond to this. Um, so if, uh, you know, if, if actually we only had these few people who had these specialist skills or we'd lost a bunch of people from the organization and we hadn't, you know, whatever it might be, um, there's sort of different levels of capacity that are necessary to be able to respond effectively to things going wrong. If you can't tell a story about those things, you can't identify some some bits that where like we actually ran out of our ability to do that thing and we desperately needed more. Um, then that's you know that that's really important. Um, I guess to I like I like to imagine that we can improve these things without having catastrophic failure, right? And so I think that that's that's one of the good things about focusing on that story piece is that we can do that without catastrophic failure. We can still identify where we're unable to, to adapt. We're unable to be flexible in a way that was able to respond. Uh, and, and that might be saying, look, actually, the reality of responding to this relatively minor thing was that we had so much pressure to deliver to an SLA that it changed how aggressive we had to be about taking a risk because we really wanted to get in before some SLA expired, right? And so those sorts of things uh, don't have to be catastrophic to be a great learning opportunity to have people go, oh, okay, we actually need to look at this a little bit differently. We're not setting ourselves up. We're not setting up our teams to be able to succeed uh, and to make really good decisions when they're surprised. And and the nature of complex systems is that we are constantly surprised. Um, and that's, that's unavoidable, right? So, yeah. yeah. Well, and that leads into the, this next question, which is how do you get buy-in from senior management to start thinking about incidents and metrics in this way? When is it encouraged to reduce those metrics? So, you know, it's interesting because a lot of us here, we're, we're here, we get the benefit of hearing other people's stories and hearing their experiences. And, and that is one way to actually share with senior management when we can show what other organizations have done, um, how other organizations have uh, have, have reduced the, the damage or, or reduced the, the time to resolution. And, and Tim and I love to go back and forth on, on metrics, which that could be an entire other conference in itself. But when, when we talk about getting buy-in from senior management to start thinking about incidents and metrics um, in this way, uh, so I often talk about starting small, starting with one or two teams um, that may be maybe more advanced or more open to ideas or trying out new things and proving out ROI on, on those teams, because we all know C levels and, and, and those folks, they like to see that return on investment. And when we talk about technical debt and, and going back and reducing technical debt, there's an investment in that. And, and, and my friend likes to say, stop paying interest and penalties on your technical debt. When we talk to, to senior management, though, we have to explain to them in ways that they understand that this time and effort that we're going to be spending to reduce this technical debt to put in these new processes makes sense for the organization is actually going to pay off. Um, and Tim, yeah. did you want to? I, I guess the only thing I'd add to that is that, A, I come back to that, telling, telling a good story is really important uh, and it can supplant some forms of, uh, of pretty empty metrics. Um, but also uh, just framing in terms of continuous improvement, I think is really important. Like you don't wanna try and do, say we need to introduce this new process to an entire organization all at once because it's not gonna fit everywhere in the organization. Different parts of the organization are gonna have different challenges. Uh, they're gonna have different existing skills. They're gonna have different attitude to those processes that you introduce. Our, thank you. And just for the questions that we didn't get to, you can go to community.pagerduty.com tomorrow, and I will have a link um, under events and meetups 
where Tim and I will answer any of the questions that we didn't get to. Also Twitter. Oh yeah, and the Twitter. You can find me at Julie <laughs> underscore Gund. And, Tim. and I'm at Tim Nicholas. Thanks for having us, everybody. Yeah. Thank thanks, uh, thanks, Tim and Julie. Uh, well, there is one more question. Uh, are there any typical tips while handling on 30 different incidents in a day um, of various areas, various customers, and context or focus teachings in a few hours space? Uh, sometimes um, that the learning is not enjoyable with this practice. Yeah, I guess um, for me, if, when you've got lots and lots of incidents, it can be really, really hard to take the time out to to learn uh, and to adapt. And so, I guess uh, maybe controversially, and, and this is uh, you know, it depends on the on the specifics of the circumstance. But I would think about picking a very f small number of them to focus on learning from. It doesn't really necessarily matter which ones they are. Um, there'll be mm -hmm. systemic learnings you can get from that rather than trying to do some sort of really shallow learning process for for all of them um you're not going to get much out of that go go deep on on something uh learn what you can um try some things adjust uh and and um and it's it's a hard place to be right um but you can only you can only improve by seeking to understand what is this reality uh, and it can be really easy to stay on the surface um, if you don't take some time to to do that and in about 20 minutes i'm going to talk about incident response and and i'm going to be talking about different roles within incident response so if there are a lot of incidents if you have roles and and specific duties during incidents that can reduce some of the stress right. and that agreed <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Tim and Julie, uh, that was a wonderful session. Uh, glad to have you, uh, you here on the stage. Uh, looking forward, Julie, looking forward to your next session. Thank it's you. a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Yeah.